visit of Our Lady to Earth on September the 19th, 1846, is usually referred to as Our Lady of Tears or Our Lady who wept. The excitement and devotion which flourished in the wake of Our Lady's apparition to Catherine Labouré in Paris in 1830 and the phenomenal spread of the miraculous medal that followed in its path brought many back to the church. But the mountain people had never paid too much attention to what went on in the big city. They had their own sets of problems. Sunday was no longer a day of worship and glorification of God. It was just a work day like any other. The churches were empty. Their attitude towards God was a contradiction in terms when one considered where they lived. The majestic panorama of the mountain was such evidence of the splendor of God, his perfect artistry, his perfect love. As far as the eye could see were beautiful mountains, one more elegant than the other. They were broken by streams of fresh water running down to the valleys. Sadly, though, many of the gifts of the Lord were either, are either unappreciated or taken for granted. This beauty was wasted on the citizens of La Salette. Their attitude was, you can't feed your family landscapes. Into this setting, we bring two children, Maximin Girard, age 11, and Melody Matou, age 15. They both came from the nearby town, Corp. As small as Corp's was, 1,300 inhabitants in 1846, the two had never met. The farms they worked at were near each other. Melanie and Maximin had met on Thursday, September the 17th, when Maximin arrived from Corp's. The following morning, Friday, September the 18th, the children went up the mountain together, but each went to a different slope. It was an uneventful day, but being young, they planned on having a beautiful, adventurous time the following day, Saturday, September the 19th. That's the way with young people. Each day is a new day, a new adventure. And Maximum was, uh, you, well, he was uh, living really in Corpse, which is a village you pass through yeah, about 15 kilometers from here. Very pretty. Though. Yeah, he had never really taken care of animals or all that, but uh, one of the uh, persons downstairs uh, in one of these villages, his uh, shepherd boy fell sick, yeah. ill. So he was a friend of Maximum's father. He asked his father if he could lend him, lend him Maximin for a few days. And that's how Maximin came to Les Ablandes, which is the village where Melanie was working. And uh, as he came up one day, uh, well, the first day, really, with the cows up here, this was communal grounds where all the people from the village used to bring their cows. Mm -hmm. And this belonged to everyone, so they could leave their cows on, on, on these mountains, mm. you know, and everyone would share this. So he came up and met Melanie. <laughs> she was also born in Corps, but she had never known Maximum because she was always out, like we're saying, you That's know? That's right, she was never And there, were four, there was really four years difference. So they met, they spent a day together, and they said, well, if you want to, you know, Maximum told Melanie, why, why don't we spend tomorrow together, the 19th of September? And how old was he? He was 11 years old. 11. <laughs> so uh, he came up the 19th, she came up with her cows, and they met here and spent the day together. And after lunch, which was really uh, a bit of bread and a bit of cheese, and some of the wa water coming down from the stream, they felt they had, they had to uh, take a nap. This is the first time they really felt they had to take a nap, you know, <laughs> in their long lives. So they both slept, and when they woke up, well, Melanie, who was uh, always, you know, had always been working with cows, says, where are the cows? So as they were down there in a the ravine, yeah. well, Melanie and Maximum came up to where the tire starts, more or less. And as they looked down, I mean, they saw one, they looked up and saw the cows were grazing on the Gagas, which is the big mountain in front of us. And then they looked down again, and behold, a ball of fire. The globe grew larger and larger before their eyes. Melanie was mesmerized by the dazzling light. She dropped the stick which she used to keep the cows in line. Both children wanted to run, but their legs were like lead. They couldn't move. The globe opened. They were able to make out the figure of a woman inside. She was brighter than the sphere, if that was possible. She was seated as if on a rock. Her face was covered by her hands. Her shoulders heaved. She was weeping. The two looked at each other, but did not move. They would say later, the children, we were drinking 
her words. She wept all the time she spoke to us. Come near, my children. Be not afraid. I am here to tell you great news. If my people will not submit, I shall be forced to let fall the arm of my son. It is so strong, so heavy, that I can no longer withhold it. For how long a time do I suffer for you? If I would not have my son abandon you, I am compelled to pray to him without ceasing. And as to you, you take no heed of it. However much you pray, however much you do, you will never recompense the pains that I have taken for you. Six days I have given you labor. The seventh I have kept for myself, and they will not give it to me. It is this which makes the arm of my son so heavy. Those who drive the carts cannot swear without introducing the name of my son. These are the two things which make the arm of my son so heavy. Though if the harvest is spoilt, it is all on your account. I gave you warning last year with the potatoes, but you did not heed it. On the contrary, when you found the potatoes spoiled, you swore, you took the name of my son in vain. They will continue to decay so that by Christmas there will be none left. Ah, oh, my children, if you have wheat, it is no good to sow it. All you sow, the insects will eat, and what comes up will fall into the dust when you thresh it. There will come a great famine. Before the famine comes, the children under seven years of age will be seized with trembling and will die in the hands of those who hold them. The others will do penance by the famine. The walnuts will become bad and the grapes will rot. But if they are converted, the stones and rocks will change into mounds of wheat and the potatoes will be self-sown in the land. Do you say your prayers well, my children? She asked the shepherds. Ah, uh, both answered with complete frankness. Not very well, madame. Ah, uh, my children, she exhorted them. You must be sure to say them well morning and evening. When you cannot do better, say at least an Our Father and a Hail Mary. But when you have time, say more. There are none who go to Mass except a few aged women. The rest work on Sunday all summer. Then in the winter, when they know not what to do, they go to Mass only to mock at religion. During Lent, they go to the meat markets like dogs. Have you never seen wheat that is spoiled, my children? The beautiful lady then asked him. No, madame, they replied. But you, my child, she insisted, addressing the little boy in particular, you must surely have seen some once when you were at the farm of Coyne with your father. Coyne was a hamlet near the town of Cor. The owner of the field told your father to go and see his ruined wheat. 
You went together. You took two or three ears of wheat into your hands and rubbed them until they fell into dust. Then you continued home. When you were still half hour's distance from Kor, your father gave you a piece of bread and said to you, Here, my child, eat some bread this year at least. I don't know who will eat any next year if the wheat goes on like that. Confronted with such precise details, Maximum eagerly replied, Oh, yes, madame, I remember now. Just at this moment, I did not remember. At one point, when Our Lady was speaking to the children, she spoke in French. And when she said potatoes, she used the French expression. And the children did not understand, so they turned to one another. And Melanie turned to Maximum to ask for an explanation. But the beautiful lady forestalled her with these words that we ask you today. Ah, my children, you do not understand? Well, wait. I shall say it otherwise. To me, that's a very important message from our Blessed Mother. My children, you do not understand? Well, wait, I shall say it otherwise. And she has been saying it otherwise for many apparitions. Do we understand? Will she give us another chance? Then the lady, again speaking French as at the beginning of her discourse, and when giving the secrets, said to them, well, my children, you will make this known to all my people. And then she turned slightly to her left, passed in front of the children, crossed the brook Sezia, stepping on stones, emerging from it. And when she was about 10 feet from the opposite bank, repeated her final request without turning around or stopping. Well, my children, you will make this well known to all my people. These were her last words. She continued to move up the slopes. The children followed her. She glided along the ground without so much as bending a blade of grass. Then she was raised into the air. As she looked up to heaven, the children noticed for the first time that she was not weeping. She looked off into the distance one more time. The glow which surrounded her glowed brighter than ever. She began to fade. The light remained for a short time, and then it faded. She was gone. This was the shortest apparition of Our Lady that we're aware of, but she established a pattern here that would con she would continue to use again in Fatima. She begins with a doomsday prophecy. In the instance of La Salette, Our Lady made reference to the great potato famine that plagued Ireland in 1845 and had reached disaster proportions by 1846. She also predicted future famine, plagues, and suffering for France. These were all predictions of things to come which did in fact occur. Close to a million people died as a result of a wheat shortage in Europe. The grapes of France were destroyed by a pestilence. Children did indeed die in their mother's arms. But it didn't have to happen. She gave us a way out. If they are converted, the stones and rocks will be changed into heaps of wheat, and potatoes will sow themselves. And what has our mother been saying to us in this time? Pray and fast, convert. Has she not been saying, and does she need to, that we are in dire days? We can see famine covering the earth with the millions of children and people who die of starvation, the millions of unborn who die at the hands of their own mothers. 
We can see the devastation that is covering the earth, the plague of AIDS, the plague of sin that is covering the earth. Is our mother not saying today, this need not be if only you convert? Is she not pointing to he who is processing right now in our midst? Turn to my son, adore my son, listen to my son, receive my son, and you will be changed. And through you, he will change the face of the earth. In the eyes of the world, what we're doing here today seems very foolish. A beautiful July day in the summer, spending up at a shrine, walking in the heat in procession, when we could be at one of the various lakes that surround this area, the coolness of the lakes. And yet we're here to venerate the Mother of God and to give glory to God through His Mother, to listen to the words that she's giving us and to heed them. Someone asked the visionaries at Medjugorje, when will Our Lady of Guadalupe return to Mexico City? And the visionary said she never left. And although physically Our Lady left, I believe if you were to ask Our Lady when will you return to La Salette? She would answer you, I never left. Well, precious family, we are seated here with the director of the uh, sanctuary, Father Hervé Brujard. And he's just come back from a vacation and he just scaled this mountain to be with you. We have just been experiencing the procession of the Blessed Sacrament, and our hearts are just swelling. We were here eight years ago. I didn't tell him that. We were here eight years ago. It seems to have changed direction quite a bit from eight years ago. There seems to be a focus on youth, a focus on the Blessed Sacrament, tremendous focus on the Blessed Sacrament, and still on conversion. Would you say that is so, Father? It's true. In the last few years, we have made a tremendous effort to bring as many young people as possible here to the shrine. Everything that is done in the church looking towards the young people is very, very important. It's really the future and responsibility of the church. It's what I wanted to work deeply with when I became rector of the shrine. One other thing which is really amazing about this shrine is that it's one of the shortest apparitions of Our Lady, and yet it's one of the most powerful shrines that we've ever visited. I think we're allowed to listen to some very human things about the message. Mary singled out some human aspects, especially regarding Maximin's life. We hear her talking especially about a situation that arose with Maximin's father one time. She recalled something he had completely forgotten about the spoiled wheat, which took place about a year before Maximin and his father went both to see the spoiled wheat. This time, the time this had happened, the words his father had said eat this piece of bread because I don't know when you may be able to eat another. What was Our Lady asking for here? What? She was really asking for, for prayer, for conversion, and especially the, the most important, the strongest part of the message was veneration of the Eucharist. C'est l'Eucharistie.
Mmh. Elle parle de l'Eucharistie. You know, they came and they prayed. They came and through prayer they were converted. They received the Lord, he consumed them, and their lives were never the same. I think, my brothers and sisters, that you join me with the evidence that you see in this priest's eyes as he speaks about the Eucharist, about Blessed Mother, about the impossible dream that is here. I think there's one other thing that is really a, a, an important part of the message that I was never aware of before, and that is the very last words that Our Lady said to the children, which she was saying to all of us, and basically it's evangelization. But you, my children, will make this known to all my people. And this is what these brothers and priests uh, and all the La Salette fathers are doing throughout the world. We believe that this is a message for today. And you know, when something is authentic, you'll see everyone pretty much saying the same thing. What is Pope John Paul II saying? Go out and spread the good news. Let us give Jesus a birthday present in the year 2000 of millions of people knowing his name let us turn things around. And how can we better spread the word of her son than through our mother who cries for us? When we came here, when I wrote the story on Our Lady of La Salette, <clears throat> I had one image in mind, and that was basically what happened here. But then coming here 150 years later and talking to the people that work here and have tracked Our Lady's message and the inspiration that she's given them all these years, you find out something completely different, something so much greater than even the apparition that was there. And so when they say to you, well, that happened 150 years ago, it's not so. It's happening right now, right here, on top of the Alps Mountains in France. We thank you, Father Hervé, and we thank you for your cooperation in allowing us to bring this back to the people of the United States. We thank you, Father Jerry. 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 Father Jerry Com Como. Como. It's Como. like Perry Como, but it's not spelled the same way. It's Como. <laughs> for, for helping us to translate, because it is really kind of difficult for us to, to translate from French to English, and for the insights that you've given us here at the Shrine of La Salette. I would like you all. You young men out there it's still, it's who, <laughs> who are, our Lord is calling, I want you to look into the eyes of these two men and see how your lady can bless your life. Give your life to her and to her son. The fervor that was engendered when our lady came here in 1846 a hundred and almost 150 years ago has the momentum has kept up all these years today the message of Our Lady of La Salette is stronger than it's ever been another amazing aspect of it is this is the only shrine that we've ever heard of the only apparition where an actual order of religious was came out of it the order of the La Salette fathers and brothers and sisters are a product of the apparition of Our Lady of La Salette. It's a beautiful tribute to our dear lady. And when they have been asked, who is your founder and what is, your, and what is your charism, they reply, why Our Lady is our foundress. And our charism is to carry on what she said at La Salette. The apparition by Our Lady to Maximin Giraud and Melanie Mathieu high above the tree line in La Salette was approved by the bishop of the area five years to the day after Our Lady came. On September the 19th, 1851, he issued a letter authorizing devotion to Our Lady of La Salette. It was proclaimed to all the people. 
La Salette is a difficult pilgrimage place in terms of bringing groups. It's high on top of a mountain in the French Alps. The first time we went there, we wondered how high we would have to climb with our huge tour bus. At one point, our grandson Rob pointed to the top of the mountain. We could see a tour bus that appeared the size of ours. It looked like an ant. Rob said, that's where we have to go. Everybody laughed, and nobody believed him. P.S. That was how high we had to go. But possibly because of the difficulty in getting to the top, La Salette is a shrine that is not taken for granted. Tourists don't go up there. Pilgrims do. They boast about having made the journey up the great mountain. The attitude at the top is one of reverence and prayer. Mary's message of conversion and evangelization is the keynote of the shrine. The Chapel of Reconciliation is in great demand. Conversions take place all the time. The church is completely dedicated to the shrine and the message of Our Lady. Father Hervé uh, entered the seminary at 18. Eight, 18 years old, and he has been a priest now for 21 years. 21 years. We're going to come here for his 25th anniversary. <laughs> no, we're going to come back next year. And, and the year after that. And we're going to bring Americans with, us. Americans with us. And for those of you who cannot make a physical journey, share the spiritual journey with others. God bless you. God bless you. Write us at the address on our screen or call us in the United States at 1-800-633-2484. We love you.